value function is a really easy way to produce a vector valued function. Recall that to calculate the gradient of a function, you take the partial derivatives and put it in each of the coordinates of a vector. Then this vector is in the domain of this function, so the setup that I've done here, the domain is the xy plane. And then to make sense of the common application of this idea, we're going to remember that the gradient points in the direction of greatest increase of the function. So if I'm thinking of this function as a surface, then the gradient will be the xy direction that I need to walk in in order to go up the hill as much as possible. This is the direction that he should walk in to go up the hill. If the hill was steeper, then the gradient would be longer. Here's the graph of the surface. It has circular cross sections. And if you were standing at a point on the surface, then you would need to walk towards the origin in order to go up the hill. So all the vectors in the gradient point towards the origin. This part of the surface is much more steep than this part of the surface. So the vectors that are farther away from the origin are longer than the vectors that are close to the origin. All of that matches with this formula. Since this is negative and this is negative, all the vectors are going to point towards the origin. Then when x and y are large, the magnitude of this vector will also be large, so these vectors are longer than these vectors. I've picked a different scalar-valued function, and we're going to repeat this exercise. But this time, the vector field that we produce is going to be an important law from kinematics and electrostatics. It was a wig. Don't feel bad. It was a wig. Your hair can't be like that. It was a wig. So this is really like x squared plus y squared to the negative one-half power because it's in the denominator. So when I took the derivative, I pulled the negative one-half out front. Then when you subtract one from negative one-half, you get negative three-halves. And then uh, here you got the chain rule. All right, it, it seems like torture right now, but uh, I swear I am going somewhere with this. Um, so we started off with this scalar function, uh, and then we found the gradient of that function, and now I'm finding the magnitude of these gradients. So it's already kind of nice because this squared is canceling with that squared in the denominator. And then these two fractions have a common denominator. And now this numerator and denominator are actually the same expression. So this is x squared plus y squared to the power of 1. Newton is like super pumped about this. He loves this formula. If you have two objects, and this is m1, and this is m2, and the distance between them is r, then, according to Newton, the force uh, due to gravity between these two is uh, negative g m1 m2 over r squared. People call this the inverse square law. I was going to call him Newton, but we're like on a first name basis. So it's just Isaac. It's just Isaac with me and him, you know. This is that this vector field represents the force due to gravity. Here's a graph of the scalar function, little f. I started with this scalar valued function, 1 over the square root of x squared plus y squared. So this is actually f equals 1 over r. And then I found the gradient of that function, and it gave me this really complicated looking uh, vector valued function. And then just for fun, we found the magnitude of this, and we turned out to actually get uh, Newton's law of gravity. Right now, the takeaway from this is just that you can have fun making up scalar-valued functions and turning them into vector-valued functions by taking the gradient. But I should be clear about the subtext. This object, the gradient, is going to be kind of doing the same thing that the derivative does. And when we use the fundamental theorem of calculus, remember you have some kind of derivative, and what you really need to do is produce an antiderivative. The reason that we're learning about this now and viewing these two basic examples is because there is going to be a time in the future 
where you're actually going to have to go backwards. Start with a vector valued function and somehow recover what the scalar function was. Right now I'm just going to ask you to let these ideas roll around in your head and here's an interesting thought. If this vector valued function is supposed to represent the force due to gravity, then what should this scalar valued function represent?